Hello and welcome back, haven't seen you in a long time. Today we're making a mosaic shield, or smaller version of that, called a buckler. Bucklers, being a smaller version of a shield, would have been primarily used by civilians in the context of duels. And, to me, the particular interest on buckler is precisely because it is a civilian arm and therefore the range of expression and artistic creativity going into those custom pieces is much greater than the standard military issue arms that you see in museums. Obviously, what you see right now is the shield being already formed, and you don't see the mosaic Damascus in it whatsoever. So let's backtrack a little bit, and I'll explain how I got to this stage. So the project starts out the same trite way as any mosaic Damascus project begins. We make a mosaic Damascus billet, much like this one. And what we need to do is cut off this stick and stand it on its side, or rather bottom. I use the power hammer to start squashing it gently and a series of top tools to control in which direction it is stretching until I have a pancake, something like that. This particular project is inspired by the works of Filippo Negroli, who worked in Italy between the year 1510, when he was born, and the year 1579, when he died. Uh, the Negroli family came from a family of silversmiths and coppersmiths, and he, to this day, remains the master armor unparalleled in the world. Known for his employment of the technique called chasing and repose in arms, he would make arms and armor that is inspired by the classical world with a uh, Renaissance twist to it. So there would be reinterpretations a la Romana that is in the Roman style of breastplates, helmets, shields, and so on. They would reimagine what it, the classical world looked like for the knightly and rich consumers of Renaissance Italy. The theme for this particular shield is the death of Orpheus. Um, a friend of ours a couple weeks ago came into the shop and mentioned to me, hey, do you know how Orpheus died? Well, I said, I don't remember quite well. So he mentioned to me that there's a particular myth that resonates to this day and comes up, in fact, as an archetype in the context of therapy, politics, marketing, and other features. And the myth is quite interesting to me, and I think it should be a good foundation for this project. Now that the boss, or the center of the buckler, has the right height that gives me the exact amount of form that I will backtrack and push leaving only what's necessary and that is a woman's face.
In short, Orpheus was given the gift of music by the gods. Um, he also went to the underworld, and we're going to skip the whole part of that myth. Uh, in Thracia, there's a particular legend that is Orpheus, being such a beautiful player on the instrument called a lyre, would come about the villages, and the men of the villages fell in love with the way he played. So, a couple times a week, they would have time where the women were not invited, they would enjoy his music. And the women of Thracia got really, really envious. What couldn't happen, after all, they're not the center of attention for a couple times a week. So they went ahead and killed Orpheus and destroyed his lyre. So they committed a sin against art. And the men of Thracia, in response for their grave transgression, scarred their faces permanently. And that's why on Greek armor, you can tell whether it's a Thracian piece of armor that the image of a woman's face will bear scars. The person in the center of the shield is not any particular individual. It is a collective image of the women of Thracia who have transgressed themselves against art and against basically common decency. Now that the buckler is filled with plasticine, I go and move to my jewelry area and clamp it in my engraving vise. There I use a set of chisels and hammers to cold work and form all the details making the face more classical, more realistic. Now, realism is not what I'm going for here. I'm going here for the Italian Milanese or maybe Florentine style of depicting a classically inspired human figure. One of the distinguishing features of Italian Renaissance work in this specific area is the way they treat the uh, curls and locks of hair. Here I use a chisel and a graver together in order to get all that dynamic form going on around the face that frames it very well. In order to be a good craftsman and a competent artist, it's especially important to study the classics and mythology. Unlike modern pop tales, which are designed to appease the audience, so the author tries to capture something that's already in the heads of the reader or the viewer, mythology works the opposite way. A myth is a zip file. It's a collection of archetypes placed into a narrative that resonates true throughout the centuries. I did not want to make just a round buckler, and the reason for that is uh, it would appear that I just bought a piece of sheet material and worked with, and I really, really, really always insist on doing all the work myself on all my projects. So, in order to avoid any kind of misconception, I changed the shape and added a little bit of a forward slump. Uh, functionally, for anyone interested in the whole dueling and martial arts part, it is a great way to deflect an oncoming blade, but artistically, it adds more dynamism to the project. After the entire metal part is formed, it's time to roll the edges. A rolled edge is necessary for a couple of reasons. One reason is you don't want to accidentally hurt yourself on a relatively sharp side of your piece of armor or a shield. Uh, the second reason is uh, up on the edges, it is the most vulnerable. It is mo most prone to damage or bending or cracking, and a rolled edge adds a ridge of stability and rigidity and makes the whole piece solid and work quite well. And the third reason, it rolled edge makes everything look nicer.
After the steel portion is complete, it's time to work on additional ornamentation. Because this is a myth of Orpheus, I have to show the image of a lyre, uh, the musical instrument that represents Orpheus. So I take some sterling silver and start the procedure of chasing repousse only in softer, much more pleasant material to work with. One thing I'd like to really encourage is to study the originals. That is always instant humble pie. It will always put us back to like the school bench. Okay, we need to learn this thing. And so study the originals. Do whatever you can to get access to originals or at least visit museums and see these things with your own eyes and your own mind and, and be careful to formulate what it is you are looking at and also think about what you want to take away from it and, and keep in mind that it's going to be a lifelong learning experience. Because at this point in the myth, Orpheus is dead and he has a pre-existing interaction with the god of death and Hades, I place a skull to signify that Orpheus's fate to a tragic death was always present there. So it's not surprising to us that something would have happened to him. You know, I think a man needs to do his research before he starts a project and know where he's headed with it. It's not just, I'm going to go out and make a buoy knife, say. I want to make the buoy knife that I want to make, and it needs to be a, a specific type, and that's where I need to go with it. It's very important to be able to see the knife finish before it's ever started, in your mind. If you can't do that, it's hard to get to where you're going. Now that the face is pretty much up to the standard that I could allow myself, I have to put in the scars, the things that actually make it distinct. So I use a graver and cut out the actual scars, and then I take copper and inlay it where the flesh would be exposed, giving it a sense of pain and regret. Because we're dealing with the classical world, Greek or Roman world, uh, what piece of art uh, can exist without a laurel wreath around the central figure? So I take some copper and once again, surprise, surprise, engage in chasing repousse to form it. So I take an entire sheet to form just the reef like that and then saw pierce it out after I achieve a satisfactory level of representation. It was important for me to at least once make something that's not technically a blade and maybe it doesn't even have a blade. The reason for that being is uh, Art Knife Invitational as well as similar exhibitions are not supposed to be yet another buoy, yet another folder. To me they're supposed to represent everything that I think about, what I research and everything that I'm capable of. Anything I bring has to be unique and has to be immediately traceable to me even without my signature on it. In order to heat treat the buckler, we had to do some hoity-toity stuff. Uh, we took uh, some kaya wool and rolled it around making an impromptu furnace on the floor and used a weed burner to evenly heat it up. For the oil, because I wasn't sure whether it will flame, we didn't use the standard Parks 50 oil. Uh, because the shield is thin enough, it wouldn't matter, so we use regular canola oil, slightly preheated. Uh, I don't recommend using Parks 50 on any expensive oils for these procedures, because as soon as you start burning your oil, especially Parks 50, you start deteriorating it. So, fiery quenches are always a sign of moronism, and everybody here is smart, right?
One of the worst things about this project is actually polishing it before the edge. Unlike a blade where all the directions are set up for you and it's easy to maintain the direction of the scratches, uh, this is a basically a round shield with extra stuff. That means they have to be very careful and use sneaky tricks in order to go through the grits. One of the tricks is in order to avoid the digging in by the corner of the grinder's wheel, what I take is a scotch bright belt that is fairly used and therefore soft and worn in, put it on the wheel and then put my belts over it, creating an imitation of a soft wheel that will always conform to the shape of the shield no matter where I dig it in. When we right now study art and art history, most of the stuff we think about is sculpture, painting, some architecture here and there. However, in the mid 16th century, a suit by Filippo Negroli would cost as much as four statues by Michelangelo. So we must not forget the value armor specifically had as a currency between nobles and the people who move society. Although a project like this should never be rushed, I have two other items I have to complete for Art Knife Invitational, so I have approximately less than a month to make this entire buckler from scratch. But even though the time constraint is fairly slim, I think it's a good introduction to me making repose items out of mosaic Damascus. So I'll consider this as sort of a homework assignment. A shield is just a UFO in the making without a handle. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take some mild steel and forge out a handle in the style that you would see on railings of cathedrals. In order to maintain a coherent style that is distinctly pre-modern, I used forged roping motifs for the actual grip of the handle. Although at first thought, the idea of mosaic Damascus armor appears daunting. In fact, it's not that difficult if you maintain a train of thought where it is just a blade, it's just this wide and this short. So you do all the entire work you would do on a mosaic Damascus axe, dagger, sword, what have you, 
but make it a different shape. In my case, it is circular. Most of you know that I started out as an armor, and that's why this project was important to me. But fewer of you know that before I was making armor, I was a painter. So making something like a shield or a buckler combines the best of both worlds. It is a canvas where anything is possible, anything can be expressed. A myth, a modern tale, something from the inside. I enjoyed this project so much because it's also my first mosaic Damascus piece of armor. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. It was great to get back into the swing of things making armor, and I look forward to making more armor projects for this channel.